Well, we're glad that you're here this evening. Hope you've had a good day. That it's been a blessing to you. As we study this evening, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. We'll be studying out of that text this evening. There's a man several years ago that was going to do basically a run across the United States. And not very far into his run, he quit it. And someone asked him, said, why in the world did you quit? And he said, well, he said, you know, he said, it wasn't the, the big rocks that I ran into or the, the gravel that hurt my feet. It was the little grains of sand that hurt my feet and caused blisters and caused problems. I ended up having to quit. It's often the little things in life that create problems for us. It's often the little things in life that, that as we take on life, it's the little things that mount up and become bigger things. And then those bigger things become even gigantic things. And oftentimes, then what happens is we want to stop. And that's true in the Christian life. Through the years, I'm sure you've seen individuals that started out well in their Christian race. They started out running the race, and they started out running it well. I mean, they were active, they were participating, they were faithful in all duties and all aspects of their Christian life. And then as time went on, the fire began to die down. The grains of sand began to creep into their life and become create, create bigger problems. Before long, they'd stop. Statistics tell us that we lose, <clears throat> the Lord's church that is, we lose about 9 out of 10 converts. 90% of those that we help teach the gospel and convert, we lose. Astounding numbers, astounding figures. And what is it? Why is it? What can we do to help? Well, those are questions that we all ask, and we, we ask them all the time. I mean, I've sat through countless elders and meetings and elders and deacons meetings and congregation meetings that have asked that question. I don't really know that there's any one good answer, one pat answer, because if there was, there'd be books written on it, and people would be doing it, and things would be different. I talked to a preacher back a few years ago. He was a preacher of a larger congregation. And he was going to step down, and somebody else was going to take the pulpit, but he was going to step down, and he was going to try to figure out how to close the back door of the congregation because he said, our back door is as big as our front door. And I told him, I said, good luck, good luck, but you won't be able to do it. Now we are several years into that project, and sure enough, he's found out he can't do it. Sadly, sadly. Yet he's still working on that, and I, I pray for him often and hope that, that things change. But what is it that we might say that would help individuals to not stop? Well, this evening, that's our lesson. You know, I could use this thing. That's, the, that's, the, that's our lesson. Don't stop. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is dealing with his own problems as far as ministry. Paul is feeling... I believe pressure. Paul says we are perplexed on every side. Verse 7. Distressed, but not brought down. Persecuted, but not forsaken. How was it that Paul was able to keep going? And I believe that this is as important for you this evening as it is for the individual that's weak. You might say, preacher, you know, you're preaching, as the old saying goes, you're preaching to the choir. Why? Because we're here on Sunday night. You know, it's not a matter of that we just came this morning. We're here on Sunday night. And in all aspects of our life, we are trying to be faithful. So you're, you're pardon the expression, if it's offensive, I don't mean for it to be offensive, but you're preaching to the choir. Well, the reality of it is, is I think these are things that Paul reminded himself. Don't stop, and here's some reasons why. So I, I give them to you tonight to lift up your faith, to encourage your faith, to build you up, not to tear you down or not to, to, to cause you to stop and think about, well, where am I in my faith? But just to remind you that here's the reasons, or here are some reasons. These are not a final list, but here are some reasons why we need to keep running the race, keep living the life as God would have us. First of all, look in verse 13. 
We learn there to trust in God. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I have believed and therefore speak. He said, we also believe and therefore speak. Trust in God. He's quoting out of Psalm 116. He says, he says you've heard this. Believe and therefore speak. He says, we believe. Faith really keeps us going. Now, we, we know faith. We've defined faith here recently, and so we'll, we'll not take the time to spend a great deal of time, rather, in discussing that. But we understand faith is that acceptance of things that really we haven't seen, whether it's past or, or future. We accept those things, and we accept them as true based upon evidence that has been pointed out to us that would lead us to believe and cause to believe that these things are true. That's faith. Faith is what brings us to God, and faith is what causes us to hold on to God. Faith is what causes us to say, you know, I believe God. I believe what he has to say. Now, let's understand. Let's back, maybe backtrack for just a second, but let's understand that we can have faith in a lot of different things, right? We can have faith in a lot of different things, and we have faith in a lot of different people, and we can have faith in a lot of different philosophies and ideas. It doesn't mean that they're right, but we can have faith in them. We can trust them. Faith in God is a little different. Why? Because we're trusting the supreme creator, maker, and sustainer of us all. We're trusting in him that has made us, but not only him that has made us, but him that has given us all things. And we're much like Paul sometimes. Remember, as Paul was was going, if you will, on the trip to Rome in Acts 27th chapter and verse 25, when the ship is being tossed to and fro by the storm, and he goes to the sailor, Paul does, and he says, he says, God has told me we're going to get there. And he says, and I believe in God. I believe that it shall be even as he has said it to me. Acts 27, verse 25. That's faith. That says, okay, I believe God. I believe that, that what he said, I believe what he said in his word is true and right, and I hold to it. Why? Well, maybe it's something that David said in 1 Chronicles 29. Part of a song there, if you will, a song of thanksgiving, a song of praise. He says in verse 12, he says, in your hand, strength. In your hand is wealth. In your hand is power. Talking about God. You see, he trusted in God. Life throws at us some curveballs. Faith is sometimes difficult to hold on to. Why? Because we're dealing with things we haven't seen. That's faith, right? If if it is empirical, in other words, if it is something you can use your senses on, if it's something empirical from the standpoint of touch, feel, taste, those things we say, okay, we have confidence in. We understand those things. Why? Because from a physical, human standpoint, these are things we can touch, feel. These are things we understand, we recognize. Faith goes on the unseen. Faith goes on what is yet to be seen. And faith goes on what could have been seen, but we were not there to see. That's faith. And Paul says, I trust God. I believe God. I believe that he, he will do what he says, but I believe and therefore speak. Faith will sometimes come in doubt. Matter of fact, we're told, once again, 90%, which is seemingly the, the statistic of the evening, but 90% of all Christians at one time or another will have a faith crisis. And in that faith crisis, here's what they'll do. They'll doubt. Faith crisis is often brought about because of some event in our life that just creates hardship and ultimately creates doubt. That doesn't mean, and, and as we said this morning, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you're a genuine person that's really just struggling with your faith. And it's all right to struggle with your faith as long as you come out on the other end more committed, stronger than what you went in. 
As long as you do that, okay. And as long as when you're in that faith crisis, as long as you're searching and seeking in the right places, aren't too many people that I know of, when they have that faith crisis, began to look outside of the very faith which they have. It's not a matter then of, if you will, examining their faith to see if they are believing and trusting in what is right or good. They are searching for something else to fill that void in their life. And that's not where they need to go. They need to stay with God. Paul said, he said, I believe God. And I believe what he said, and therefore I speak. And so in the midst of, of wanting to know how do I keep going, how do I keep from stopping, if you will, just simply trust in God. Lean upon him. Trust in him. Hold his hand. And it will come to pass. Next, look at verse 14. Look what he says in verse 14. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord will also raise up or also will raise us up with Jesus we should be like him. Paul says, need to know something, that there is that which is yet to be. We need to learn to look forward in life. We often look backwards, but we need to look forward. Why? Because forward offers us hope. Backward offers us doubt, offers us despair, and offers us second guessing. Looking forward, however, helps us to propel or to motivate or to move forward in the direction in which we need to move. It's called hope. And one time was on a, a ship and he was experiencing sick sickness, which I have not experienced, but I've heard that it's, you know, it's awful. And he was up on deck and he was having problems. His stomach was coming out and he was having great difficulty and Finally, one of the sailors came by and he kind of patted him on the back. And he said, head up, old boy. He said, nobody's ever died from being seasick. And the old passenger that was having trouble looked at the sailor and he said, get out of here and shut up because that's the only hope I have is of dying right now. Well, sometimes when we're sick, you know, that's, that's uh, we just got to, we, we think that. We have to look forward. Paul said that he was looking forward to the resurrection. Paul said, with regards to that, knowing that he who raised up the Lord, God, will raise us up also with Jesus, that we should be like him. I like that. I like that idea of looking forward, looking not behind us, but looking forward. Paul, remember, that's the same Paul would write from a standpoint of years, a few years later, the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, and he would tell the church at Philippi, he said, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, Christ Jesus the Lord. Paul says, we're looking for the Lord. And in looking for him, we're looking forward to it. And while Job would say, though after my though after my flesh worms destroy my body, yet shall I see God. You see, he had a hope. Now Job proposed that very idea. If you go backwards a few chapters to Job 14, verse 14, Job asked a question in which the implied answer was yes. And the question was, if a man dies, shall he live again? Yes. And so Job, in asking that question, says, okay. He says, I know. Not a, not a guess, not a thankful, but I know. I know that there's something beyond. We've finished you know, a month, but really, of talking about that. But it, it is an assurance that Paul had, and Paul kept moving forward. He did not stop. He kept moving forward in his faith. Why? Because he realized that there was something yet to be. It was that hope that was driving him on. It was that hope that was steering him on. It was that hope that kept him going. And it can all of us. If we understand, remember, just hold to the Lord. Just keep fighting the fight. Living the life. Knowing that there is something yet beyond. And it's something to wait for. 
you know, in life, we've probably had things we've wanted to wait for and couldn't wait for them to happen. And then there are other things that we hope never came, right? Let me give you two examples. As a kid, I always couldn't wait for Christmas. At the same time, too, as I told you this morning, my mother took me out twice every service and spanked me. There were times that when I was out and I had pushed her a little bit too far, when you get home, you're getting a spanking. Is there somewhere else I can go? <laughs> I look forward to that. But if there was a promise of Christmas or something else in the future, I look forward to those things. Paul said, we know that he who's raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up also. There's hope. There's hope. We're not, once we die, we're not dead all over. There's life beyond this life. And so Paul says, don't stop, keep going. But then look at verse 15. If you look at verse 15, notice what he says. He says, for all these things are for your sake. Notice what he says. All these things are for your sake. Well, what's all these things? All the things that Paul had been going through. All these things are for your sake. They're, they're not for mine, they're for your sake. And so sometimes we need to stop and think about what is... And how much of what I'm doing has an impact upon those that are around me? <clears throat> how about my attitude and my actions? Are my attitude and my actions such that have a positive impact upon others? And you think about it, if I quit my faith, how many others are going to follow? Me? If I don't follow through on what I believe, if I don't follow through on following the Lord, <clears throat> how many people are going to follow me? Or not only just follow me, but how many others faith might be weakened because of the example that I have set before them. Young or old. Paul told Timothy when he was young, he says, Let no man despise your youth. First Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. What about the older person? There are those watching him as well. You see, we as Christians need to understand that we, we all have an impact upon others. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, let your light so shine before men that they, well, who's they? Men, may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So notice what he says, let your light shine so that the world can see you, so that they, the world, can ultimately glorify your God that you're serving. What a great thought. To think that we really touch others. And you might say, oh, but preacher, my circle of influence is very small. I don't have a big circle of influence. Used to, maybe, but I don't anymore. You know, some of my friends, uh, they've gotten where, where don't see them much anymore and not around a lot of people and so forth and so on. But you still have a circle of influence. You still have people that look to you. You still have people that are watching you. You still have people that are, that are if you will, eyeballing you. And as they are, they're watching to see. They're watching to see what you're doing. There was a gentleman one time, and this was several years ago, but there was a gentleman one time that took a, a very small can of penetrating oil and he put it in his pocket. And everywhere he went, every door that he opened, every gate that he swung open, that he heard a creak, he stopped and he went back and he oiled the hinges. That's all he did. He was known far and wide throughout his, the community for being the man that helped keep the squeaks out of the gates, the doors. And he had a great impact upon the community. Why? Because all he did was when he saw or heard what seemed to be a little nuisance to others, he added a little oil to help remove the squeak. It's a great thought. We impact others. We influence others. Don't think you do? First Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul is thankful for the church at Thessalonica. For from you has sounded out the word of the Lord. Evidently, the church at Thessalonica was a good missionary, missionary church sending a message out. But the message was not sent out through missionaries. It was sent out through the brethren. And Paul said that from you has sounded out 
the word of the Lord. The word sounded is the idea of a bugle, a bugler, I should say, a bugler blowing his bugle so as to get the sound out. From you sounded out the word of the Lord. Well, what was it that they sounded out? Well, you go down and read the, the next verse, verse six, it says, or verse seven, it says that in all things they were examples. They followed the faith and people were watching and people were seeing and people were noticing. And so we ask ourselves, how many people are closer to heaven because of my life? How many people are doing the right thing because of my example? How many people are, are trusting enough in me that they're doing what God would have them to do? Paul says, look, my ministry is not just for, for me, it's for you. Paul understood that old principle of whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Paul not only preached it, Paul lived it. And so Paul's ministry was all about others, just like Jesus. When you think about the ministry of Jesus, truly the word others comes to mind. He lived upon this world because of others. He died on the cross because of others. He focused his life of service to others, for others. And so the challenge is to all of us as well. And so keep that faith. Don't give up. Think about others. Where are others and what are they watching because of me? And what are they doing because of me? But then next, go to verse 16. Verse 16 and 17 may be more familiar to you, but if you look in verse 16, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet he says the inward man, notice what he says, it's being renewed day by day. The outward man is having trouble. The outward man is, is flesh, and the outward man is struggling with the ideas of Christian faith in the world, Christian faith in what's going on in his life, Christian faith and, and other philosophies. He says the outward man's perishing. The outward man's wearing away. The outward man's getting tired. The outward man doesn't want to do anymore. He's tired of being beat up. He's tired of being discouraged. He's tired uh, of being set up. And so thus, consequently, he's ready to give up. This is the inward man. No, he realizes that there's truly advantages for his soul to reap. He realizes that there is something beyond. He realizes the, the impact that he's having upon others. He realizes that he needs to look forward because he understands several things. He understands, first of all, the brevity of life. He understands Psalm 90 and verse 10. The days of our years are 70 years, and by reason of strength, 80 years. But we are soon cut off and we fly away. He understands that. He understands that he will not on this world or in this world, he will not live forever because he's physical. One day he'll take his last breath. One day he'll sigh his last sigh. One day he'll moan his last moan. As he breathes his last breath. And as his soul departs from him. But realizing that, he also realizes and he understands that while life is short. And yet there's a better end, as we've already talked about. He realizes that his soul can reap good because that the suffering that he's going to bear. Will be but for a little while. In Romans, the eighth chapter, in the 18th verse, Paul makes that statement. He says that I reckon that the suffering of this time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in heaven. He said it's, it's so short. It, it doesn't last long. It's only temporary. Here today and gone tomorrow. Seems like a long time, as we talked about in Bible class this morning. Suffering seems like it's, it lasts forever, doesn't it? But when we look at it and we analyze our life, really our periods of suffering are short in comparison to our regular times. But we realize that there are advantages to our soul. 
that we reap in our difficult times. But there are advantages in our soul if we'll just keep moving forward. While Paul would press toward the mark of the calling of God in Christ Jesus, as we talked about recently in Philippians chapter 3, Paul would understand that there is that benefit. And so he would say in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord for as much as you know. Well, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If my labor is not in vain, the Lord, somebody's going to have to explain that to me. Because you see, there are times when I meet a brick wall. There are times in which, as a preacher, people aren't listening. There's a time in which people don't heed. There's a time in which people aren't moved by the gospel. They don't want to give up. Back 28 or so years ago, I was talking to a gospel preacher. And he had been to congregation that he was there at he had been there for about 30 years and he said i just don't get it and i said what is it you don't get he said used to when i stood in that pulpit and i preached the gospel he said people not only responded publicly they responded personally you could see that in their lives they listened and they gave heed to what was being preached but he said, now I preach. And he said, I, I preach the same truth. And I know of changes that need to be made in people's lives. And yet he said, they don't make those changes. They don't respond publicly. They don't respond personally. They don't respond. He was ready to throw in the towel. He did. Not much after that. Of course, he was well past the age of retirement. But sometimes we have to realize personal responsibility that we all have but we have to acknowledge the fact that we make those choices and the choices we make we consider the advantages of what our soul will reap because of what we have done and so paul said don't stop i'm not stopping because i'm looking towards what is yet to be and i realize that my soul will really reap from it but then he says in verse 17 and 18, once again, two verses that are very familiar. He says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us a far more exceeding way of eternal glory. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen, what are they? They're eternal. The best is yet to be. Physically, as we said, physically, will end. We'll either die or the world will come to an end. One will one will proceed the other. When, of course, the world comes to an end, that's when we die, if we're still here. If the Lord allows the world to continue, we pass away. But notice what Paul says. Paul says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's working us a far more exceeding way to eternal glory while we do not look at the things that are seen with the things that are not seen. Because the things that are seen are going to pass away. The things that are seen are going to end. The things that are seen are going, to be, are going to be no more. And while I will, and we all will, we'll reap that which is better in the end. We, we, we'll all be able to understand that the God that keeps us, Jude 24, reminds us that he holds us, Jude 21. And while we just finished a series of lessons on the idea of heaven and serving God and heaven being our reward, we understand that the best is yet to be. It's not here. It's not here. That's a concept which the world is beginning to, unfortunately, accept, is that heaven is here on earth now. It's a concept that I read, uh, I'm going to, to work something into either a bulletin article or a devotional or maybe even a sermon. I read just two, three days ago a new Gallup poll that less people now believe in the Bible 
than did just five years ago. The percentages are down. Less people are going to church now than they did just five years ago. What What's the problem? What's the reason? I'm not sure. I don't think anybody really knows. I think it's a, a multitude of things and not just one thing. But maybe it's because we really haven't looked at the things that are unseen. We've based our faith on the things that are seen. And Paul says, don't do that. Because then if you go to the very next chapter, I don't think you see Paul's thought ends right there at the end of that chapter. I believe that Stephanus Bees, who was responsible for dividing the Bible into chapters, I believe that the horse must have whinnied or something there, and he just thought that was a good place to end, or he came into town and he thought that was a good place to end, but the thought continues. In the fifth chapter in verse one, he says, For we know that if the earthly house of this tent is dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He says, You see, there's something yet better to be. And then notice what he says in the very next verse. He says, For this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. He says, There's something beyond this life. There's something that, be- that is better. And so he goes on to say, He goes on to tell us what? He goes on to say that he's seeking heaven. That there's a judgment coming. And so as he walks by faith and not by sight, he realizes that he pushes forward. He's realizing that there's something better. He's realizing that there's something yet to be, and it does not compare with what we have. And so consequently, Paul says, don't stop. Don't stop. Know that the eternal rewards that you're about to reap are everlasting, number one, but also know that not only are they everlasting, but they're far better than what you think this world has to offer. And so keep digging, keep pushing, keep striving, keep living. Life is not easy at times. It's difficult. But it has its eternal rewards if we'll keep it up. Have you ever seen a natural pearl? I found two. Be careful when you eat oysters. I found two. They're not that pretty. They're pretty once they're polished up and all. But nevertheless, I asked a lady down in uh, Gulf Shores a few years ago. She was shucking. We were sitting at a counter. Ethan was little. We were sitting at the counter, and she was shucking oysters. And I asked her, I said, do you find many pearls? And she said, used to. But she said, you don't anymore. Well, I have found two for her. But those pearls came about, why? They came about because an oyster, sitting wherever it may have been, in the bed or the, the bottom of the ocean, had a grain of sand that came in to its shell created an irritation, and so it secreted nacre, or what we call mother of pearl, to cover up that grain of sand so that it wouldn't be an irritant to it. And then as time goes on, it just secretes a little more to it, and then a little more, and then a little more, till it finally grows to, to be fairly good size. That's how a pearl is formed. Life has its grains of sand. But Paul says, don't stop, because one day you're creating a pearl that will shine bright and eternal. So keep fighting the fight. Keep pushing on. Keep struggling the struggle. This evening, if you need to become a New Testament child of God, or you need to rededicate your life, our prayer is that you'll come while together we stand and sing.